grid, uh, the two axes of the grid, the vertical axis about the genesis or the evolution of thoughts from the most primitive raw beta elements through alpha, through dreams, up to preconceptions, and then to conceptions, and then to concepts, and then to theories, and then to algebraic calculus. So thoughts are becoming more and more symbolized, more and more uh, abstract. Uh, and then on the horizontal axis, this concerns the thought, the, uh, the uses to which thoughts may be put. Now we're shifting from the mind of the patient to the mind of the analyst. The, uh, the vertical axis concerns the mind of the patient. Um, and we're trying to help our patients evolve psychically. Um, not just intellectually for, for, for beyond, obviously. We're trying to help our patients evolve emotionally. Um, the horizontal axis concerns our mental functioning, the mental functioning of the analyst, who is trying to uh, understand the patient on more and more, you know, on deeper and deeper levels. Um, so we go from an initial, an initial definition of the situation, what he calls a definitory hypothesis, to notations, attention, inquiry, action. The analytic investigation, the analysis, is deepening and focusing. Um, now, in both cases, both the vertical and the horizontal, both the mind of the patient and the mind of the analyst, um, we're talking about a, a positive evolution towards truth. Emotional and psychic truth. Um, but the grid is also used for the opposite movement to understand devolution, away from the truth, flight from the truth. And one could say that Bion's whole understanding of psychopathology is that it is a flight from truth. It is an evasion of truth. Psychopathology is truth evasion. And, you know, the most severe forms of psychopathology, psychosis, is the most severe form of truth evasion. Tr truth is seen as so painful. I mean, for all of us. For all of us. Um, but for the psychotic, the, the truth is so unbearable, he doesn't just try to fragment the object, he tries to fragment his own mental apparatus. He attacks the receiver, not just the painful truth which is to be received. Uh, okay, we saw that Robert Young quotes um, the, the late beyond uh, in his later years uh, being very dismissive of the grid. I think this is an, we, we can analyze this in Bionian theory. Um, Jung, Jung is quoting Bion, dismissing the significance of the grid. Many, many of us love to hear that. Because we're, we all want to evade the truth. We, we all want to evade serious thinking. We, really, we all want to evade new ideas really new ideas. We, we, we want to evade the work. Let's talk about Bion's work group. <laughs> we want to evade the work of learning something fundamentally new. So we, we very much welcome Robert Young quoting the old Bion. Ah, oh, Bion turned against the grid. I don't have to learn it. There's nothing to it. It's not worth struggling with. Well, I disagree. I think it is worth struggling with. 
not to be used in a mechanical way. But it is a powerful um, description of what psychoanalysis is. It's an attempt to help our patients evolve mentally. Okay. Um, this is not... Uh, Beyond's theory is a type of relational psychoanalysis, I suppose, but it's very different from the kind of relational psychoanalysis um, following the work of Stephen Mitchell and the intersubjectivist Stolero and those people. I mean, this is a relational psychoanalysis, but it's a Kleinian type of relational psychoanalysis. In very broad terms, it's really all about the evolution from PS to D. But, be, but Beyond really fills in what that move is about in a, in a much more detailed way, I think. Um, the mind of the analyst needs to be in a maximally receptive state in order to be open to the experience of the session. Uh, so Bion has this idea that for each new session we have to get rid of memory and desire in order to keep our preconceptions from being prematurely saturated. We want to come with unsaturated preconceptions. We want to come with receptiveness. We don't want to be preoccupied with yesterday's session. We don't want to be preoccupied with the interpretation that worked so well last week. We don't want to be preoccupied with some important dream that the patient has told us previously. All of this has the effect, or can have the effect, of blocking the analyst's receptiveness to the new experience of today. Okay, that's a quote from Bion, um, or from the Symingtons, I don't know which, on page 42. Um, okay, uh, I think we understand what's being said here the importance of being open to surprise, being open to what is new, not being preoccupied with what's now stale. Um, but I think this is one-sided. Um, I think the truth is that sometimes remembering yesterday's session helps. Um, I think sometimes remembering that important dream helps. Uh, it helps us understand and see more deeply what's going on today. So, I mean, I think it's true that some people take a very concrete reading of beyonds without memory and desire, and they make it sound absurd. I don't think it is an absurd idea. I think it is a good idea to arrive without preconceptions. But I think it's one-sided. I, I think we do come to the session with desire. I think Bion comes to the session with desire. His desire is that the patient evolve towards truth. Um, and sometimes remembering previous work is helpful with this. Okay, it's a bit one-sided. Okay, chapter five is called Myth and the Grid. And uh, one of the important ideas here is that this pursuit of knowledge, well, in every area of human life, um, progress is usually followed by backlash. Progress is followed by backlash. You know, we say two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. Um, the psychotic part of the personality fears and hates contact with emotional reality. Now, 
much of the time when, when Bion is talking about psychosis, he's talking about the psychotic part of all of us. He's not talking about psychotic people. Um, this is Kleinian. Uh, really, all he's meaning here is that when we are operating in the paranoid schizoid position, we're operating in a psychotic position. The paranoid schizoid position is the psychotic part of all of us. And this part of us hates emotional reality. And we attempt to destroy emotional reality or to flee from it. Uh, we try to fragment or destroy painful thoughts. And sometimes this involves destruction of our own perceptual apparatus. We attack our own receiving function. In, in the language of container and contained, um, this attack on the mind is an attack on the container. Our minds are potential containers of truth. If the truth is unbearable, we attack the container. And sometimes the container becomes like a sieve. You know what I mean? S-I-E-V-E -E in English, sieve. Uh, something that you strain the pasta through and the water falls out and the pasta remains. A sieve. The mind has holes in it. Um, this blocking of truth and this attack on the mind uh, reminds me of the Lacanian idea of foreclosure. Okay, Lacan is talking about psychosis and he's talking about a foreclosure of the gap between subject and object. He, a, foreclosure, a foreclosure of the fundamental cut. The fundamental alienation in which I recognize I am not the other. When this is foreclosed, we have psychosis. Um, this, is, this is how Bion understands uh, the Oedipus myth. The soothsayer Tiresias is a blind man. Uh, Oedipus ends up putting out his eyes. Uh, this is an attack on sight against knowledge. But you're asking about that, that place where, where they're talking about how beyond um, prefers the distinction between finite and infinite and prefers to use that as opposed to conscious unconscious. I don't think I can help you with that because I don't like that idea. Um, I don't like that language. Um, I don't like that language of finite and infinite. Um, I, I must say, you know, I mean, last week I pointed out that the London Kleinians accepted Bion's work up to about 1963, and then they were rejecting of his later work, because they felt he was heading in a mystical direction. Um, his language of O, his language of finite and infinite, his description of O as the Godhead, now, this certainly does sound mystical. I don't like that term, the Godhead. And I don't like this discussion of the finite and the infinite. Um, and, you know, if I wanted to resist having to learn what's new in Beyond, um, then, then I would pounce on these mystical sounding terms as a way of not, as a way of devaluing Beyond or this aspect of Beyond's work, you see? Um, but I think that would be a mistake. I, I don't like this distinction, finite, infinite. I don't follow him with that. I put it aside. 
It's not, it's not a language I find useful at all. Also, I think, I think uh, it would be dangerous to follow that if it means turning away from conscious unconscious. I'm a Freudian. I'm not turning away from the unconscious. I'm not turning away from listening for condensation and displacement and symbolism and secondary revision, listening with the third ear. This is what it is to be a psychoanalyst to a considerable extent, in my view. To listen for primary process. The subtext, the story behind the story. The latent content. I'm not going to dismiss that at all. If that's what Beyond meant. I doubt that's what he meant. Um, so, but, but I find that, you know, when I go on studying Beyond, I... I, I'm setting aside this worry about his mysticism because I find that whenever he sounds mystical, I can, I can demystify what he's saying and find value in it. Okay? I've never been able to accept this idea of thoughts without a thinker. This idea that there are thoughts in the so-called proto-mental realm and these poor thoughts, they're so lonely, you know, they're lying around in the proto-mental realm praying for someone to come and think them. Well, to me, this is a ridiculous idea. It smacks of uh, a, a kind of platonic philosophy where there are the perfect forms in some sort of heaven of ideas. Um, thoughts without a thinker. I'm, I mean, on one level, it strikes me as an absurd idea. On the other hand, I suddenly realized, I mean, is it, is it absurd? Um, so I had, uh, I had three senior male psychoanalysts, personally, to begin with, and I knew I needed to talk about my mother. Oh, of course I had an Oedipus complex. Of course I had conflicts with my father. But these male analysts would only let me talk about my father. I guess they had never talked about their mothers. Um, so I couldn't talk about my mother, but I, I knew that my problems were really rooted in my relationship with my mother. Finally, I got a fourth analyst <clears throat> after I had graduated from the Institute. They say the first analysis is for the Institute, the second analysis is for yourself. In my case, my first three analyses were for the Institute. Finally, I graduated. I went and I got a woman analyst who had been a pediatrician and knew about babies, had studied with Bowlby, had been at the Tavistock. Finally, I had someone I could talk about my mother with. Okay. Uh, you could say I had a whole bunch of thoughts that I needed to think. But I couldn't think until I found someone that I could think them with. Okay, that's kind of like thoughts without a thinker. That's kind of like thoughts without a thinker. I needed to think and feel and talk about my mother with someone who could receive it. Someone who could contain it. These men couldn't contain it. I had to find a container. Then I could have the thoughts. Okay, that's thoughts without a thinker. So, so here again, you see, I'm, Theon is not so mystical sounding now at all. Um, okay, that's the best I can do. I can't help you with finite infinite. <laughs> Theon is trying to... He's trying to understand psychic reality in its own terms. He's trying to get beyond materialistic and physicalistic and mechanistic language. Um, and he's trying to talk about the psyche in terms appropriate to the psyche. And the term mechanism doesn't fit with psychic reality. 
And so they're saying that uh, Kleinian analysts who use still the term mechanism don't understand beyond. Well, I think I disagree. It's kind of absurd. Um, we all use the language of mechanisms. We know, we know what we mean. When we talk about defense mechanisms, we're not really reducing anything to material terms. We're using the term in a metaphorical sense. Uh, <laughs> I think this is the Symingtons being um, excessively, uh, excessively differentiating beyond. I mean, uh, last week I talked about their idealization. They're radicalizing the difference between um, beyond and other Kleinians. Um, so, I don't agree that this, the use of a term like mechanism proves you don't understand beyond. No, not at all. Um, they go on to say beyond reversed Freud's dream theory. Um, Whereas Freud thought that the dream's function was to conceal, yet reveal, Beyond thought its function was to synthesize fragmented elements into a whole. Uh, now that difference might be more, might have more value. I mean, I do think, I mean, I think both Freud and Beyond are correct. I don't think it's one against the other. But I do think that Beyond does bring a slightly different attitude towards the dream. It's not just something that conceals. It's not just something that needs to be decoded. Um, it's not just a cover story. It's, it's, it's a manifestation of this amazing quality called alpha function. It's an embodiment of this amazing quality of the mind to make metaphors. This poetic, mythopoeic, mythopoetic quality of the mind. We, we, we seem, and we don't do it consciously, but we, we, I mean, if we're healthy, psychotics stop dreaming. If they start to dream, you know they're getting better. Why? Because if they start to dream, alpha function is starting to work again. They're not just pervaded by beta elements. Alpha function is working again. Um, they're starting to be able to mythicize, narrate, make metaphors. This is health. Um, I'm not Jungian, but you know the Jungians have a sense of the soul and of soul, what they call soul making. And, and uh, I mean, to be psychotic in a way is to lose one's soul. Uh, uh, alpha function um, is soul making. You substitute the word self. I, I'm not wedded to the religious sounding term soul. We can, but we're talking about, we're talking about um, a subject. Well, we could use the Lacanian idea of a subject. Um, alpha function generates subjectivity. So, okay, so the dream is not just a cover story. The dream is performs an integrating, symbolizing, narrating function. It takes up our experience and turns it into a poem. That's mental health to be able to generate these images. Okay, so there is a difference here. Uh, Beyond is emphasizing something about dreams that Freud is not oblivious to, but he doesn't make it central. There is a difference here. Uh, okay. Okay, so let's come back to container and contained. Um, containing is not Winnicott's holding. Um, the, the, the Bionian container can be a destructive container, not just a constructive container. Uh, it might crush the contents, it might crush the contained. Or the other way around, the contained, K 
can be explosive and destroy the container. So we're, we're not talking about something like holding. For Winnicott, this is a function that the analyst provides, a holding environment. This is quite different from Beyond's uh, containing function. Um, I've already talked about how I myself needed to find a container for the thoughts about my mother that I needed to explore and have analyzed. I found uh, a woman analyst who could contain this. Um, then I could work it through. Um, he gives a, clinic, a clinical example of, uh, of a patient um, who prefers pictures of himself to the real thing. Pictures of himself to the real thing. Um, it, may, it immediately made me think of Lacan's imaginary ego and the imaginary level of experience. Uh, as I go through Lacan, I'm finding lots of parallels with, La uh, as I go through Bion, I'm finding lots of parallels to Lacan. In, in various ways. Okay, on um, page 59 of my text, we come upon what I have identified as Beyond's bias. I'm trying to be very even-handed here. I'm trying to appreciate Beyond and, and not dismiss him uh, and not indulge my own discomfort with new ideas. But on the other hand, I want to be critical. I want to be critical because he does have a bias. His bias is towards linking. I wrote an article that's in your journal in, in uh, Psychoanalytic Discourse, and it's called Attacks on Separating. Okay, uh, Bion writes brilliantly about attacks on links. This is how he conceives of psychopathology as breaking links, attacks on linking. But psychopathology is equally as much attacks on differentiating. Being, Bion is all about matching, but he ignores distinguishing. He's all about pairing, but not about separating. He's all about coupling. He's not about decoupling. Okay, we need to do both. So uh, R.D. Lang, Ronald Lang, uh, is a Sartre, and he's following Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, he draws attention to the other side. All, di all distinctions are of mind, in mind, by mind. No distinctions, no mind to distinguish. Okay, so there's Lang, emphasizing the mind as a distinguishing process. Uh, Sartre says, uh, in order for me to know this book, I have to place a nothingness between myself as knower and the book as the known object. I place a nothingness, a gap, a lack. Lacan is simply Jean-Paul Sartre, read through linguistics. But anyway, Sartre says, to know this, I have to put a gap between knower and known. And then to know the book, I have to put a second nothingness. Between, you know, surrounding to distinguish the book from the table that it's sitting on. I distinguish it from me, I distinguish it from the table. The mind is a distinguishing process. This is not that. Bion is, is, is always working the other side. The mind is a linking phenomenon. Well, of course it is. It's both linking and separating. I mean, so in in, in early years in primary school, we all had those tests. Compare and contrast. Compare and contrast. Show the links, show the differences. We need to do both. Okay, uh, Bion shares the bias of relational psychoanalysis. Relational psychoanalysts are all about linking. They're all about relating. They don't talk much about separating and individuating. Psychopathology is attack on boundaries. It's not just an attack on links. 
We know this. We know the crazy patients who can't stand boundaries. We know our own craziness, where we have trouble as therapists maintaining boundaries. Um, okay. I, I advocate what I'm calling a dialectical approach to psychoanalysis, which is both and. We both, both links and separations. Okay, what's, here's, what's the opposite bias? The opposite bias is the Lacanian emphasis on law, boundaries, gap, lack. The no, le nom du père, the no of the father. If Bion is one-sidedly emphasizing link, the Lacanians are one-sidedly emphasizing separation. We have to have a dialectical psychoanalysis that studies not just paternal function, but maternal function. Um... Okay. In pathology, the container is absent or defective, damaged, porous. Um, the analyst may be not able to contain. The patient uh, doesn't find understanding. Okay. They write, there is pain which cannot be suffered, guilt which cannot be contained, regret which cannot be remembered. All of this pain can't find an adequate container. And in pathology, we see the container being attacked. Um, this, these attacks on containment um, results in a situation where the pain is not suffered. I mean, that's a good way of describing what, as therapists, we're trying to do. We're trying to help our patients suffer. Now, that's an unusual definition of what a therapist does. A therapist... <laughs> we're, we're not... Well, that's actually, in, in the Bionian perspective, it's true. We're not, we're not so much trying to... We're not so much trying to ease our patients' pain. We're trying to help them bear their pain. Helping them bear their pain. Helping them suffer productively. That's a good way to put it. They're suffering unproductively. We're trying to help them suffer productively. What's the difference? We're, we're trying to help them think about their pain. Talk it about it, feel it, and and think about it. Um, when pain is not suffered, because it it can't find the containment. When pain is not suffered, it it, it becomes meaningless. And and so, in this attack on meaning, uh, this results in a kind of nihilism. Bion talks about nameless dread. He talks about mindless greed and destructiveness. Mindlessness. Mindlessness. Um, this, is, this, I think, is Bion's equivalent of death drive. Uh, the, the destruction of meaning. Okay, uh, again, this, this, this is his vision of what alpha function is and of what the healthy mind does. It creates meaning. This is why dreams are so important. They create meaning. The mind, when it's functioning properly, creates meaning. 
create stories and images and metaphors. Um, but the sick mind destroys meaning. It destroys meaning. And when this destructiveness goes too far, we wind up with a kind of nihilism, a kind of mindless meaninglessness. Um, the container can become destructive due to the projection of destructive envy and greed into the breast. It becomes a bad destructive breast, which is the basis of what Bion calls the ego-destructive superego. The ego-destructive superego. This, this is destructive containment as opposed to constructive containment. Instead of a, a commensal link, a productive linking, there's a parasitic link, a destructive linking. Um, on page 57 of uh, the Symington's book, uh, they, it's sounding quite mystical. There, there's a reference here to direct contact with God, uh, a, a reference to... Uh, God's container. He's talking about the mystic, the so-called mystic, the person that, that Bion calls the mystic. And of course, you know, it, it would appear that Bion is writing about himself, that he considers himself a mystic. And the mystic is in direct contact with God and is God's container. Um... And this is opposed to the establishment. The establishment tries to contain the mystic's truth and mediate it to the people. The establishment is like the church. It tries to contain the Christian church, tries to contain Christ's message and mediate it to the people, to ordinary people. Uh, but the establishment comes to oppose the mystic because the mystic keeps discovering new truth. Um, the mystic's function is to explode the establishment. The mystic becomes a threat to the establishment. It's like the establishment say, is saying enough already, you know. Uh, we, we just, well, you could think of the international, say, let's think of Freud as the mystic and the international psychoanalytic movement as the establishment. And Freud produces his first theory. Um, but then in 1923, he upsets everyone. He says, I got it backwards. I, 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 I thought repression caused anxiety. No, I now see that it's anxiety that causes repression. Well, now all of the analysts who learned the old Freud have to drop all of that, and they have to relearn a whole new approach to psychoanalysis. Um, and some never really managed it. Um, Lacan goes through three phases and when he moves on he closes a whole institute and he starts a new institute um, so the creative genius which Bion calls the mystic is a threat to the establishment Bion says he leaves Bion left England in the latter years of his life because he said he was in danger of being so loaded with honors that he would sink without a trace. He has this idea that the establishment starts loading you with honors so that you stop being creative because your creativity threatens the establishment. Um, okay, so look, it would be very easy to dismiss all of this as a kind of narcissism, as a kind of grandiosity, some weird mysticism on the part of Bion. I don't think so. I think he's on to something here. Of course, the great German sociologist Max Weber was on to the same thing. Uh, Weber talked about the charismatic leader and, and how the message of the charismatic leader comes to be routinized. He called this the routinization of charisma. 
the church routinizes Christ's message. Um, the International Psychoanalytic Association routinizes Freud's message. They put it into formulas. They administer it bureaucratically. And in a certain sense, they kill it. Um, uh, this business of the mystic and the establishment, it's uh, um, around page 57 in the Symington's book, he writes, uh, the Christians got him in the end, God. Christ the Christians got him, God, Christ, in the end, um, from his messianic prison house. He never escaped till every vestige of meaning had been squeezed out of him, unquote. That's a quote from Beyond. The Christians got him in the end from his messianic prison house. He never escaped till every vestige of meaning had been squeezed out of him, unquote. So that's what the church did to Christ, according to Beyond. Um, and, you know, this is what the establishment <laughs> is going to do to the creative thinker. Um, he talks about projection of the destructive superego into the analyst so that the analyst's interpretations are felt as annihilating, as crushing containment instead of productive containment, as a crushing containment. Beyond's containment is an internal process. Winnicott's holding is more of an external process. Beyond's containment is non-sensuous. Winnicott's holding is sensuous. Um, okay, it's important to distinguish these two things. Okay, chapter 7 is about alpha function. Um, The psychotic makes fragmenting attacks on his mind to obliterate awareness. Um, and, and the psychotic fears reintegration because reintegrating, reintegrating his mind will confront him, he fears, with a terrifying savage superego. So, the patient is fragmenting his mind out of fear of a painful attack, an unbearably painful attack. Um, he can't dream. But in therapy, the psychotic will produce visual pictures. Um, these visual images are, are, appear in the session as if they are dream images. And Bion sees this as, as uh, precursors of integration. Uh, so I think this is a contribution to work with seriously psychotic patients. I mean, Beyond sat with very, very psychotic patients, and he would find these fragmented images, uh, and he would see these as attempts to get alpha function going, attempts at integration, but of course the integration is also dreaded because integration will lead to unbearable truth. The synthesis, dreams are a synthesis, contribute to a synthesis which is dreaded by the psychotic. So he attacks this function to avoid integration, to prevent the emergence of a painful reality. And, and here we come to this emphasis on the crucial decision. And this is kind of an existentialist element in Beyond. He's talking about a decision. 
The decision is either to evade frustration or to modify frustration by thought. That's the crucial decision. Is, is frustration something I'm seeking to evade or am I willing to tolerate the frustration long enough to begin to be able to modify it by thought? I, here again, I'm reminded of Lacan's distinction between empty speech and full speech which I think echoes Martin Heidegger's discussion of idle talk, empty speech, idle talk. This is flat speech devoid of resonance. Um, empty of deeper resonance. It's, it, it, it's speech that doesn't have undertones or overtones. It's like manifest without latent. You can't interpret it. It's flat. It's empty. There's no metaphor. Um, I, I'm thinking of um, certain films, uh, Lynch. Lynch's film, Blue Velvet. There's nothing to interpret in that film. It's psychosis. It's just right there. <laughs> uh, you can't go away and think about the film and find latent themes. There are no latent themes. Everything is right there on the surface. Nothing to interpret. No resonance. Um, uh, instead of a contact barrier, we have a beta screen. Okay, the contact barrier is is what allows the unconscious to uh, resonate on the conscious level. It, it, it permits contact between conscious and unconscious, but it's also a barrier so that the conscious is not flooded. The contact barrier uh, keeps primary and secondary process separated, but it allows contact between them. Um, there's a permeability. The contact barrier allows a certain permeability not a swamping, it's like a membrane, a correlation of conscious and unconscious, allowing resonance, resonant speech versus empty speech. Um, but when uh, that breaks down, uh, then, then we have the beta screen instead. No contact barrier, but instead the beta screen. No thinking can take place. There's a discharge of beta elements. Uh, tension, but not any real thinking is taking place. The analyst is tempted to become accusing or to act in some non-constructive way. The so Morris, yes. Mm -hmm. um, can we say that uh, the borderline patients are struggling to find some sort of contact barrier? I mean, with borderline patients, sometimes, sometimes you feel like they have or there is something like contact, uh, contact barrier and sometimes there is not. Yes. I think that's or true. Yes, yes, and it's it's frustrating because uh, sometimes they will have a contact barrier and they will bring um, resonant speech, and you begin to feel that you're being allowed to be an analyst. Yeah. <laughs> you get excited. Oh, I. 
Today I can interpret something. There's something that can be interpreted, and I can be an analyst. And uh, uh, but then it's quickly taken away from you. Yeah. It it isn't sustained. Yeah, I I think that's true because I think I think the borderline patient realizes where this is going to lead, and they realize that this is where you want to take them. You want to take them to a place they don't want to go. Yeah, yeah this is true to Elijah, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, uh, you know, Bion is a very existential thinker. I mean, he, 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 he realizes how radically different we are, well, as does Lacan. This is something they have in, ca in common. We are not mere animals. We've, we've broken out of animality. Of course, we're still animals. We have bodies and we have brains, but we've broken into the field of what Jean-Paul Sartre calls le néant. Um, we have this strange human mind which, which lives in a world of meaning and, and which anticipates death and has remorse and regret and guilt. Uh, I mean, you know, this is what Heidegger, this is what Kierkegaard, this is what Sartre, this is what... Uh, all of these thinkers uh, recognize it's the, it's the human condition. So we have this strange psychic reality. Um, and it involves pain. And, uh, and health involves facing pain. And learning how to bear it and think about it. Uh, but there's this profound urge to flee from it. And the whole thing is a moral enterprise. I mean, there, there is an, an intrinsic morality, of course, in all of psychoanalysis, and it's very clear that it's here and beyond as well. That's why he uses the word decision. Um, okay. Um, they, they, they make the point that for beyond, counter-transference always means the subjective counter-transference. That is, coming from my own personal neurosis. Um, most Kleinians make a distinction between two kinds of countertransference, the subjective that's coming from my neurosis, and the induced that is being stirred in me by the patient's projective identification. Um, Beyond's term for the latter, for the induced countertransference, is the beta screen. This is the induced countertransference, the beta screen. And, and in the face of this, the analyst tends to become either accusatory or reassuring. He stops thinking. The beta screen promotes acting out in either an accusing or a reassuring way. This is discharge rather than interpretation or thought. And so then we come to the whole theme of detoxification. The mother processing the infant's beta elements, containing them productively, subjecting them to alpha function in her reverie, and then giving the beta elements back in tolerable form. They've been subjected to alpha function. Uh, it's interesting. Um, there is mention here of her love for the infant and for her husband are part of this process. Beyond doesn't talk about love a lot. You know, I, I accused him in, in our first lecture, I accused him of being a rationalist like Freud and um, paying attention to the rational leadership Ralph and Piggy, but not giving enough room in his thinking for Simon. I think I was a bit unfair in saying that, although not entirely unfair. I, I mean, I, I think there is a big 
<laughs> there's a big a big emphasis on on thinking in beyond and uh, but occasionally one encounters love um, her lo mother's love for the infant and for her husband is part of her reverie um, and and here there is mention of the male I'm not sure whether this is beyond or the Symingtons uh, but but the emphasis on the male standing for the principle separating the infant from the mother you don't hear much about that in beyond who as I've said is all about linking but here there's a mention of the male principle separating the infant from the mother um, Okay, pain, uh, frustration is faced rather than evaded, but when the pain becomes unbearable, feelings may be obliterated, or at least awareness of them is obliterated. In the psychotic part of the mind, thinking is opposed. Uh, one evacuates or discharges instead of thinks. And, and he's alert to the, 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 the little signs of evacuation, yawning, the patient yawns, the patient grimaces, the patient sneezes, evacuating on thinkable beta elements. We've all had those patients who have to urinate or defecate before they come into our office. Or they immediately leave and go and urinate, or they interrupt the session and have to go to the bathroom, whatever. All of this for beyond discharge of beta elements. Freud, in Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud has that wonderful phrase, human malaise. Human malaise. He's being very existential there. He's saying, he's talking about the human condition. He's talking about the burden of anxiety and pain and frustration that is nobody's fault. It's not due to private property or capitalism or mother. It's just the human condition, Freud says, that we all have to suffer. Um, of course, the existentialists elaborate on this. The, the, the mental pain that comes with freedom. This is Kierkegaard. We seek to escape from freedom. Both Sartre and Eric Fromm escape from freedom, the burden of freedom. We escape it into patterns of bad faith. Then there's the death anxiety that Heidegger associates with human being in the world. Um, we either learn to bear all of this, says Beyond, or evade it and discharge it. We either learn to suffer it by thinking and feeling, or evade it through distractions, discharging it into the body, uh, or inflicting it on others, on scapegoats. Um, or we might seek to be mindless. We either develop our minds, and of course the whole movement, productive movement in the grid, is a movement towards developing the mind, evolving the mind. Or we seek to be mindless. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, certainly the, the so-called critical theory of society, the Frankfurt School of, of Critical Theory, has long suggested that we have been for a long time in the midst of a cultural regression, a cultural regression, a so-called post-truth world, where the distinction between truth and lies is blurred. This is a civilization that's becoming mindless. I mean, people don't want to think about climate disruption. Um, the establishment doesn't want to think. It wants to stop thinking. It wants to stop evolving 
It wants to stop suffering. It wants to get rid of the messiahs. It wants to evacuate and discharge all of the ways that we can evacuate and discharge. We can use substances, alcohol, cocaine, hypersexuality. Uh, chapter 8 is called um, a, a Diagnosis of Thought. Um, he, they begin this chapter with a long quotation from Immanuel Kant who refers to the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. I do not merely conjecture them. I see them before me. The latter infinitely raises my worth as that of an intelligence by my personality in which the moral law reveals a life independent of all animality and even of the whole world of sense. This is Kant, Critique of Practical Reason, the moral law within me that reveals a life independent of all animality. So this is conscience. This is Simon. Um, this is a little bit out of step with the rest of the chapter, which is all about thought, not conscience. Um, okay, so now, now I have to become critical of Beyond again. Um, you know, his formula PSD with the arrows going both ways. Um, but he's got it backwards. He's got it backwards. And, and um, Ron Britton follows him. I, I don't understand uh, how they made this error. Now, of course... No one's going to listen to me pointing this out uh, because the establishment doesn't want to hear criticisms of establishment heroes. Heinrich Racker is an establishment hero. I wrote a, a paper about Racker's error. It's a glaring error that Racker made. Um, on the other hand, you know, I mean, of all of the papers I've written, it's the one that is most in demand and most read. And I'm, I'm, I'm reprinting that paper in the, in the book that's coming out from Rutledge next year. So people are open to reading about Racker's Air, apparently, but it's just the establishment doesn't want to know about it. Uh, and no one's going to want to know about this criticism of Beyond because it's embarrassing. Beyond and Britain have got something backwards. Uh, they're trying to talk about creativity, and they associate P or, uh, P, they, they associate the paranoid schizoid position with chaos, and the depressive position with coherence. And they're saying that in creativity, you have to let go of the the the, the rigidity the rigid coherence of the depressive position and surrender and regress into paranoid schizoid um, uncertainty and chaos in order for creativity to take place. Now, it's widely understood in psychoanalytic circles that creativity does involve letting go of a rigidity and tolerating confusion and chaos as part of the creative process. There's no argument with that. That's true. Lowald says that. Many people say that. Ernst Kreis said that. But the, the problem with Bion is that he associates rigidity with D and uncertainty with PS, when in fact it's the opposite. Rigidity occurs in PS. The splitting of PS is a rigid order. 
Order is not D, order is PS. When we move out of PS, we leave certainty. This, the certainty of all good, all bad. Fundamentalism. Rigid ideology. That's all PS. And we move to D, where we begin to be able to bear on certainty. Beyond is, is associating uncertainty with PS and certainty with D. He's got it completely backwards. Um, Beyond also refers to depression as a characteristic of the depressive position, but that's an error. There is no depression in the depressive position because depression is the feeling that I'm all bad. That's splitting. You don't ever have depression unless you have splitting. You have sadness. Sadness occurs in D. But not depression. So, you know, this is just erroneous. The baby is in need of a breast but no breast is present, so experiences pain as a present depriving breast. The no breast is present. This is experienced as the presence of a cruel no breast. Okay, the absent good breast is felt by the baby as a present persecuting breast. Klein says much the same thing but Bion puts the point very well here. The absence either creates a thought or a bad no-thing to be expelled. A bad no-thing to be expelled. So immediately, you know, he's writing about the no-thing. And I'm thinking Jean-Paul Sartre, being and nothingness. Being and nothingness. Sartre is writing about the experience of nothingness as a thing, a negative thing. Uh, Sartre is writing about how our lives are haunted by nothingness. And Lacan is saying the word is the death of the thing. The word is the death of the thing. The analyst's absence, if it's not thought about, we have the pain of the no breast projected. Um, he gives a clinical example of the projected, the patient who projects the no breast onto her partner. The no breast is projected into a persecuting object rather than leading to thought. Uh, the pain of absence has to be tolerated in order to generate to, to, to generate thought. If the pain of absence can be contained then we don't get this projection as beta elements. Um, here's an important point um, I, I, that I think the relational analysts need to, to think about more. Therapy cannot merely be provision of presence. It also has to provide absence. Um, a lot of self-psychologists departed from Kohut himself. Kohut himself, Heinz Kohut himself, argued that the analytic process had to, con had, to be, had to contain what he called optimal frustration. Analysis has to be optimally frustrating. But many of the self-psychologists rejected that aspect of Kohut's thinking. And they replaced the idea of optimal frustration with the idea of optimal responsiveness. Okay? From a Bionian point of view, well, Bion is with the, the early COVID then. 
I mean, analysis has to contain frustration. It has to contain absence. Because it's, it's, it's only through absence that thought can begin to occur. It's not enough to provide presence. On the other hand, this gets complicated, admittedly, because, because you could say that we have to be present enough to help the patient contain absence. It's our presence that uh, hopefully builds up a, a, a growing capacity in the patient to be able to tolerate absence. I, I, I think, of course, you're right. Uh, there is. Um, there, there, there are places where it becomes very evident, like at one point, um, the Symingtons describe um, Beyond's idea that um, that in in special moments the object um, grants the the knower the gift of permitting at one minute with the object, permitting at one mint. Uh, this is a gift. He's talking about the theory of grace, the Christian theory of grace, that through God's grace, um, he, grace means gift, a free gift. So in Christianity, God gives the free gift of himself in Christ for man's redemption. Um, Bion says the object, um, will sometimes give as a free gift uh, the thinker, will allow the thinker to have a moment of at one -ment. See, he's saying ultimate reality is ultimately not knowable. He says we can't ultimately know reality, but we can be it. He's talking about transformations in O. We can't know O, but we can be O. Um, and, 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 but, but we can only be O for moments. Now, of course, one can emphasize the uh, mystical aspect of this, but I find it totally unnecessary to go religious or mystical here. Totally unnecessary. Let me use a really banal example. Um, I love blues music and rock and roll, and, and my son is, is a, a rock guitarist. And uh, jazz musicians and blues musicians, I probably all musicians, will tell you that um, when they're playing together in a band or an orchestra, there are moments when the band is simply in the groove. They have found the God spot, if you want to use that language. They're in the groove. It's a magical moment. The music just comes together. They're together. And then it ends, and then they laugh. They laugh because they know they were in the groove. They, knew, they know they had it for a few seconds. It was, they were in ecstasy. It was ecstatic. Everything was working perfectly. They nailed it, but then, but then you can't hold it. You can't hold it. Then it's gone. Um, this is a magical moment. You don't need to talk about God. You don't need to talk about anything mystical. You can just talk about how, you know, the band was in the groove at that moment. Um, and this can happen in many ways. It can happen between people. It can happen in sports. Um... So, okay, yeah, sure, there is, uh, there is this, uh, the, there are these Christian overtones. Yeah, the emphasis on suffering. I don't think it's just Christian, though. I, I, maybe it's biblical. Maybe it's in all of the Abrahamic religions. I don't know enough about Islam as a religion, but 
I'm sure it's there in Islam, the emphasis on suffering. It has to be. It's there in Judaism. It's not just there in Christianity. Um, so yes, Theon's theory yeah. is, is, is compatible with... Um, look, the whole of existential philosophy is rooted in a biblical worldview. I mean, um, Islam and, and Christianity and Judaism all believe they are all existentialists. The religions are all existentialist. Why? In what sense? Because they say man is free. That he must choose between good and evil. He has the freedom to decide one way or that's why we're responsible. We're responsible. I mean, if we didn't have choice, we wouldn't be responsible. So, yes, Beon is in the biblical tradition. And, of course, being a, a, an Englishman, his version of the biblical tradition is Christianity. I don't know whether he was a practicing Christian. I don't know whether he, he ever went to a church or not. I don't know enough about his life to know that. Um, that's about the best I can do. 